So earlier in the semester, we used tangent lines to introduce the derivative. Now what we're going to use is areas to introduce the definite integral. And then in section 5.3, we'll be introduced to the fundamental theorem of calculus, which shows a connection between these two. So to start off, we'll start off with some easy ones where we don't need calculus. So if you look at this problem here, it says find the area under the curve between x equals 1 and x equals 4. And here's the curve, y equals 2. So no calculus required here between x equals 1 and x equals 4. Well, I mean, we could, we could break this up into pieces. and makes it really easy to see. The area is going to be 6. Or we could use this formula from geometry, length times width. Got this length, which is 3 units. The width, which is 2 units. And we get 2 times 3 equals 6 square units. So pretty easy. No calculus needed for that one. The next one, not quite as easy, but still not too bad. If you want to find the area under this curve between x equals 0 and x equals 2. So it looks like we've got something like this. Well, this area we can also find with a formula from geometry because we just got a triangle there. And we know the area of a triangle is 1 half base times height. Or in this case, 1 half, the base is 2, right? The base along here is 2, and the height is going to be 4. So the height coming up here is 4. So we end up with 4 square units. Then we come up with this other one. Find the area under this curve between x equals 0 and x equals 5. So between x equals 0 and x equals 5. So we want to find this area here. Well, at this point, you know, we've got this kind of strange curve here. And we definitely don't have any formulas from geometry to help us out here. So if we wanted to figure out the area here, we are going to... We're going to need some help with this one. So to do this, let's think back to when we first started talking about derivatives. And we first approximated the slopes of tangent lines using the slopes of secant lines. Then we took the limit of the slopes. Remember, we took the limit of the slopes of these secant lines to find the slope of the tangent line. So we were, we were using limits here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to approximate the area of a region using the areas of rectangles. We will then take the limit. So here's a limit again limit of the areas of these rectangles as the number of rectangles approaches infinity. This will allow us to find the exact area of the region. And we're going to do something that's very similar to what Archimedes did a long time ago. So he was a Greek mathematician and typically regarded as the best mathematician of antiquity. And always on the list of the top four or five mathematicians that the Earth has produced. Um, he's always on there. And he understood the basics of integral calculus. And he used what's called the method of exhaustion, which is pretty much what we're going to do. But we extend it a little bit further by taking the limit. And the limit is something that the Greeks, um, they never uh, used the concept of a limit. They had a really hard time with infinities. And actually, the concept of, of nothing also. But infinity gave the Greeks a, a hard time. And some of you may have heard of Zeno's paradoxes, which uh, mathematicians have, have uh, 
consider Zeno's paradoxes settled. They don't consider them paradoxes anymore because they, they argue that they're settled using the concept of a limit. But not everyone agrees that it's settled, and especially in philosophy and uh, maybe even in physics. There's uh, some debate as to whether those are truly settled or not. But I'll just mention one of them because these paradoxes have a lot to do with calculus because of the idea of a limit. So one of the Zeno's paradoxes is the idea of if you have a person standing here, here's this, this person, and let's say it's some guy and he wants to go to this wall right here. So the idea is Zeno would argue that he'll never get to the wall because before he gets to the wall, he's going to go halfway there. So he'll be, he'll be right here. And then before he gets to the wall, he's going to go halfway there. So then he'll be right here. And then he'll go halfway, halfway, and he'll consider, he'll continue going halfway. So he'll never actually get there. And of course, we know that he does get to the wall. So Zeno would say, well, what's, what's wrong with my argument? How can he get to the wall when we know he can always just get halfway and then halfway and halfway and halfway? So we can see kind of a geometric idea of this if you think of distance. So if you think of this instead of like, okay, what is the, the total amount? So the, this person is going to go halfway to the wall and then half of that and then half of that, and then half of that. So this is kind of like a geometric interpretation. And if we keep adding this up, can we go to infinity? Can we go past 10? I mean, how, what does this add up to? We're going to keep going an infinite number of numbers. An infinite number of numbers are going to be added together. So couldn't it go as high as we want? Well, it's, you know, may seem a little strange, but the answer is one. And you can see the answer if we think of a square that is one unit by one unit. So let's say this is one unit by one unit. And you can see these numbers inside here. If we think of the area of the square, the area of the square is one by one, which is one square unit. So... Here's one half, right, that's this one. Now take half of what's left, that's a total of one fourth. I'm gonna add that together. Then take half of what's left, that's gonna be one eighth. And I'm gonna add that together. You can see we can keep going, but we know what we're gonna get. When we add all of these up, we're gonna get the entire area of the square, which is one. So this. Actually, all of this just adds up to 1. So, um, this is a, a, a paradox. Is I didn't probably say this paradox exactly right, but it's very similar to that. And if you get a chance, just look up Zeno's paradoxes. There's a, there's a handful of them. But all of them essentially come down to this concept of completing an infinite number of tasks in a finite time or something along those lines where the concept of a limit, as far as mathematicians are concerned, can answer those questions. So to see what we're going to be doing in section 5.1, let's take a, take a look at an example here. So we've got example 1 says... Use rectangles to estimate the area under the parabola y equals x squared from 0 to 1. So we've all seen this, this parabola a whole bunch of times. So let's say this is 1 here and 1 here. So y equals x squared goes something like this. So here is, let's say, y equals x squared. And we want to find the area underneath this curve between 0 and 1. So we are looking for this, this area right here. So what we could do is start off with 
uh, an approximation using a triangle. So we know that the area underneath this black line here, the area under that black line could be found by the area of a triangle, which is one half base times height, right? Which is going to be one half base times height, which is just one half. And we can see that our area is definitely less than that. So, so far, we have a real rough approximation. We can say our area is less than one half square unit, right? So we start off and we have got this. We know our area is bigger than zero. There is something here, but it's less than one half. So here's where we're going to start getting into this idea of integration. So we're going to try to do better. We're going to try to get an approximation of the area using four rectangles and right endpoints. So first let's redraw our parabola. Something like this. And so we want to find this area right here, right? We're looking for this area. So what we're going to do is we are going to break this up into four rectangles. And they're going to be, we'll, we'll break up the number line. So we'll use, uh, there's one half, one quarter, three quarters, and then one. And it says using right, using four rectangles and right endpoints. So what that means is we're going to think of this as coming straight up here. So for this first rectangle, here's the left endpoint, here's the right endpoint. We're going to use a right endpoint and just bring this straight across. So for the second rectangle, Here's a left end point. Here's a right end point. We use a right end point. And the right end point we're basically just using to get the height of our rectangle. And if we continue along this way, we will go like this. Now we're going to find the area underneath this, these four rectangles instead of the area underneath the curve. And we know we're going to be too high, right? We're going to overestimate this because we have this area up here that's that's too much. It's above the curve. But it gives us a starting point. So the way we do this, the notation for this is, is R sub 4. And what this means is we, we're using right end points, four rectangles. Right end points and four rectangles. And then the area is going to be the area of this first rectangle plus the area of the second rectangle plus the area of the third and the area of the fourth. And we know the area of a rectangle is just base times height. And isn't it true that the base of each of these is going to be one-fourth? This distance is one-fourth in each case. So we could go get this first rectangle base times height. Okay, there's the base, one-fourth. Now the height Remember that this curve is y equals x squared. So the y coordinate right here is just one fourth squared. The y coordinate right here to get that height is one half squared, right? So to get each of these y coordinates, we just have to plug in x into the equation y equals x squared. So this first one is going to be base one fourth times height, which is going to be one-fourth squared because I plug in one-fourth here to get what the height y is. So base times height, which is one-fourth squared, plus, now I come over to this rectangle here, base is one-fourth. So I got one-fourth base times height. Well, the height of this rectangle is whatever the y-coordinate is here, and the y-coordinate here is x squared, so it's one-half squared. So multiply by one half squared. And then the same thing here, base is one fourth. The height of this rectangle, the third rectangle is just three fourths, whoops, three fourths squared, right? You plug it in there. So you get times, or plus one fourth times three fourths squared. 
Then finally go to the last rectangle, base is one fourth, and the height is just gonna be one squared, which is just one. So we go plus one fourth times one squared. So if you go through and do all the calculations, you get 0.46875. And a little bit of a warning here, five one and five two are are fairly tedious sections. We do a lot of stuff like this. But here's what we need to know. This is too big. We know it's too big because we've got all these extra areas up here, right? All this red here, that's extra area that we don't need. So all of this red area is an overestimate. So one thing we can we can notice is this. With an increasing function, with an increasing function, like y equals x squared, it's increasing, meaning as we move along here, as x goes up, y goes up. It's increasing as we go. With an increasing function, r sub n will be too big. All right, because r sub n for each of these rectangles is taken the tallest point, and it's always going to be taller than the first point because the function's increasing. Okay, so r sub 4 gives us an, uh, we're a little bit better than we were. It's better than using a, the one triangle, which gave us an area of 0.5, so we're, we're narrowing it down a little. But now, let's try the same thing with four rectangles, but using the left end points. Okay, so we'll use the left end points this time. So do the same thing. Let's do, uh, so this will be one and one. And draw our graph of y equals x squared. So it goes something like this. So then we can... Uh, do the same thing as before. Let's break this up into four pieces. So we have one fourth, one half, three fourths, and we've come up here. Well, this time we're going to use left end points. We can still do this though. We can come up here. But this time, when you look at this first rectangle here, the left end point is here is zero. So this first one is gonna be, um, gonna have no area at all. Then you come to the second rectangle, here's the left end point and the right end point. We want the left end point this time. So we come across here. And then, well again, let me, let me shade in what we want. We want, all this, right? You want the blue. You want to find the area under the curve. So we come to the third rectangle, and again, we're going to use the left end point. So that means we will use this number to find the height, and then finally, the left end point, and the last one gets us here. So we're going to, instead of finding the area under the blue, we're going to find the area under the black here. We can see by looking, we're going to be in, uh, we're going to be under the estimate now because we're going to have all this area that we're not counting. But if we go through the same process and we find L sub four, and the notation is similar, left end points, four rectangles. So we're going to find the area of this first one. Well, there this first one base is still one quarter, right? The base of, is each going to be one quarter but the height now so look what we're doing now now we're actually using this end point and in our when we calculate this we're not going to use this one so it's sort of like we shifted everything over so if you look at our last one last time we used these numbers here and we didn't use zero we didn't use zero so it's kind of like the, the numbers that we're going to use we're shifting them all over this way so that we're not going to use the 1, but we're going to use the 0. And that's what happens to the left end point. So L sub 4 
is going to be base 1 quarter times height, which is going to be 0 squared. Because that's the height of this first rectangle. The, this rectangle, this first one has an area of 0 because the height right here is 0. Then we're going to add this rectangle in, base 1 fourth. The height is going to be 1 fourth squared. So you're going to go plus, oops, this is, uh, this is supposed to be 1 fourth here, right? Base times height. So then the second one is 1 fourth, and the height is going to be 1 fourth squared. So that's this one, base. The height of this rectangle is 1 fourth squared, right? Because again, this, this line is y equals x squared. So if we want to find any of these, these points, like this point, this point, or this point, it's just going to be the y coordinate at this point. So it's going to be 1 fourth squared for this one. Now this third rectangle, we're using the left end point. So the third one is going to be 1 half squared. So base is 1 fourth times height 1 half squared. So go plus 1 fourth times 1 half squared. Then finally go to this last rectangle and the base again is 1 fourth and the height is going to be 3 fourths squared. So go plus 1 fourth times 3 fourths squared. If you go through that math, we'll get 0.21875. And we know for sure it's going to be too small because it's missing all of this red here, right? It, it needed to count that to get an estimate, and it didn't. It's missing all of that. And we can say in this case with a decreasing, or sorry, with an increasing function, again, because we've got an increasing function, with an increasing function, L sub n underestimates the area. Or to be consistent with the one above, I guess I should have said, L sub n will be too big. But you get the idea, right? Because it's, gonna, it's always going to pick the shorter side, so it's going to be too small. But we do have some improvement now, so we can we can improve on our on our estimate for the area. The area underneath y equals x squared between zero and one. Now we can say this: it's between this number and this number. So if we did the same process but used eight rectangles, and you can imagine, I'm just going to draw. 8 above so you can see what's going to happen but the more rectangles we have if you look up here let's say instead we use 8 rectangles so if we used 8 here it would be coming up here 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 and here and now if we use the right endpoints we're going to get here and here you can see what's going to happen we're going to get a lot less errors right and here and here so so we've cleaned up a lot we've got all this stuff here that used to be an error will no longer be an error so when we divide these into more rectangles we're going to get a better approximation now the trade-off as you can imagine is we're going to get more calculations it's not as big of a trade-off anymore in modern times with calculators and computers but it used to be so with eight rectangles we're doing a little bit better yet. We can we can do better than this. With eight rectangles, we can divide it. We can see that A, we have a little bit more precision here. And then further divisions give us this. So when N is 10, 50, 100, or 1,000, we get these. And what we want to do is see if we can notice, does it look like these are approaching anything? Like look like maybe there's a limit like a limiting value here like infinity here of course we can't really break this up into an infinite number of pieces right we, we just can't do it 
we can't break it up into an infinite number of rectangles and then add up the areas of all those rectangles, but we want to see this is like the limiting value. As n approaches infinity, what does it look like L sub n and R sub n are approaching? So if you just had to guess, if you just we just had to guess a number here, I think most of you would probably say one third. It looks like it's approaching one third. And we're gonna see that, that that actually is true. We're gonna see later, not very <laughs> much later, pretty soon actually, but it can be shown that the area equals exactly, notice that, that's not an approximation, that's exactly the limiting value of L sub n as n approaches infinity, and also equals exactly the limiting value of R sub n as n approaches infinity. Remember, n is a number of rectangles. So if we had an infinite number of rectangles, they'd be infinitely skinny also, right? But the limiting values of this is exactly one-third. So now that you see a little bit about what we're going to be working on, let's see if we can generalize this process and figure out what integration actually is. So if we want to find the area under this curve, we're going to divide it up into a bunch of rectangles. So let's say we want to find the area under this curve, y equals f of x, between the point A and B, just some x values. So what we do is we divide it up into pieces, and we're going we're gonna to call this first part right here, we're going to call this x sub 0. So A is x sub 0, and B, we're going to call that x sub n. So then this first little spot here is going to be x sub 1, and that will be x sub 2, x sub 3, x sub 4. And then over here we'll have this one would be x sub n minus 1. And that's about as far as we need to go. So... For this one, we're going to use right, we're going to use right endpoints. So for this first rectangle here, this first one, we're not going to use a left endpoint, we use a right endpoint. So we'll follow this up, and where that hits, we come across. Same thing with this one, right end, right end point, we come across. So that we will have something like this. So some will be overestimates, some will be underestimates, and over here. So we are going to find the areas under these rectangles. And the general idea is the more rectangles we have, the better we'll be. But then there's more calculations also. So, all right, we've got this picture. So let's see what we've got. So the width of the interval, well, the width of the interval, meaning this interval from A to B. So in other words, let's say this is, let's say B is 11 and A is 1. The width would be 11 minus 1 or 10, right? So the width is just going to be B minus A. Width of the interval is just B minus A. And then we're going to have this little um, delta X here. It's just going to be the change in x. That's going to be the width of the width of each rectangle is going to be delta x. And what that's really going to be is the width of this, which is b minus a, divided by how many of these rectangles there are. Right? So this delta x really is just going to be b minus a over n. Then also we can see that looking at what we've got here, we start with x sub 0, and x sub 1 is just going to be a plus delta x. So x sub 1 is going to be a, our starting point, plus delta x. Right, and x sub 2, x sub 2, that's just going to be a, right, a plus 2 of these delta x's, because each of these is going to have the same width of delta x. So that x sub 2 
is going to be a plus 2 delta x. And, of course, x sub 3 would just be a plus 3 delta x and so forth. And then for this part here, we're using the right end point, right? So for us, we're using the right end point. And we can approximate the area of the ith rectangle by thinking of it like this. So here is the x-axis. Here is y equals x squared. Then what we would get is the two sides of the rectangle here. So if this is the ith rectangle, the ith rectangle, then this would be x sub i, and then this would be x sub i minus 1. Right? Like, just think if it's the second rectangle. Here's 1, 2. Here's the second rectangle. This is x sub 2, and this is x sub 2 minus 1. So this will be here. So since we're using the right endpoint, this would come across here. And to find this area right here, this area under the curve, we would have this would be the height, which is going to be f of x sub i, and the width is going to be delta x. So just looking at that picture, we can see that the area of the ith rectangle is going to be f of x sub i times delta x. So for any one of these rectangles, the area is just going to be width times height, right? Just like a rectangle. So the width is going to be the change in x delta x. The height is going to be the, the function's value at this input. So with that in mind, we can find an approximation for the area under the curve. So the area under the curve can be approximated by r sub n. So remember what this means. We're using the right end point and we're using n rectangles. So think about what that means. That means we would have f of x sub 1 times delta x. Just to make sure we're clear with that, let's look back at the picture here. We're using the right end point, f of x sub 1. That's going to give us this height, right, times delta x. So we start here. So we don't start at x sub 0. We will start here, though, when we're using the left end point. But when we're using the right end point, we start at f of x sub 1. Okay, and then with the right end point, we'll go all the way to x sub n. When you do the left hand point, everything gets shifted over 1. So we would start at x sub 0, and we would go to x sub n minus 1. Because for the left end point, we're going to use this. We're going to use this to find the height of this rectangle. So for the left end point, it would be up here. Okay, so going back over to here, r sub n. If you look at the picture... And then you can see that we're basically just going to add up all these rectangles all the way across. So we'll get f of x sub 2 times delta x plus, and we would keep on going, and we would get f of x sub n times delta x. And then with a little bit of algebra, we could factor out that delta x, and that's going to basically be delta x times f of x sub 1 plus f of x sub 2, plus all the way to f of x sub n. And if you think about it, what these are, these are all y-coordinates, right? These are just the y-coordinates. The function, when you plug in x sub 1, gives you the y-coordinate at x sub 1, and the y-coordinate at x sub 2. So we can basically add up all the y-coordinates and multiply that sum by the change in x. And what else do we have here? Well, as n increases, the area approximations get better and better, which we've seen, right? The more the more trying the more rectangles we have, the better the area is, the smaller the errors are. And we approach the exact area as a limit. So here's this idea of a limit. So to get the exact area, we actually need that limit. We're always going to have approximations until we take the limit. 
And it was just like before when we were talking about derivatives. We were taking the limits of those secant lines, but we would use the slope formula from algebra class, so we would get a, an approximation until we actually took a limit, and then we got the slope of the tangent line. So very similar here. So if you want to get the exact area, the exact area, not an approximation, then we're going to have to take the limit. If you want exact, we need the limit. And you can see it here. So the area equals, not approximate, but equals, area equals the limit as n approaches infinity of r sub n. And that's the limit of this. So the one above, we didn't take the limit. We just added these up. But now n is going towards infinity. So if n is not a finite number, but a limit as, as n approaches infinity, we're taking the, the limit of the sums of all of these. And then we can do that with the left-hand limit also. So if we're going to take the limit, it doesn't matter if we're using right endpoints or left endpoints. For an approximation, it will. If we're doing an approximation, we're not taking the limit. We get different numbers for these, as we saw in the very first example. But when you're going to get the exact area by taking the limit, it doesn't matter. These are going to be exactly the same. And in fact, it doesn't have to be the right end point or the left end point. It could be any point. So sometimes you see this phrase, sample points, x sub i star. This just means it could be any point at all. Using any point for the height, it could be the midpoint, a random point in that little sub interval. They're just sample points, but still we get exactly the same. So if there's a limit involved, it doesn't matter where you get the height, you're going to get exactly the area. So this one, just to fill in some the blanks over here, this is using right endpoints. Using right endpoints, using left endpoints. And then this is just means using any point in the subinterval or in each subinterval. Sometimes they refer to this here as right sums. So if you hear right sums, they're, they're referring to using the right endpoints. So left endpoints, of course, that'd be referred to sometimes as using left sums. And then when you use sigma notation, we can use we can rewrite all of those three things above a little simpler because if you look at what we've got here and think about how this is n goes one, two, three, four, all the way to n. Well, summation notation allows us to do the same thing. So let's come down here a second and review summation notation. Just real quick. So we'll do a quick review. So review. If you have something like, so this is the Greek letter sigma, the capital sigma. In statistics, you'll see small sigma, which looks like this. But this is the Greek letter sigma. And we have something like this. And this always means, whenever you see this sigma, it means sum. It's kind of like the discrete analog of integration. We're going to sum these things up, but they, they clunk along by integer input. So this index i starts at 1, and it goes to 5. And all we do is do whatever this thing says, and we always add. When you see sigma, like this thing, sum. So we start with 1. What this means, I put a 1. I put a 1 in here, and then I add. And now this index goes to 2. I put the 2 there and add. And now the index goes to 3, and it keeps going until it gets to the 5. So this is basically going to be 3 plus 4 plus 5. So we get 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We get 15. So one that's a little more, more complicated, if we had something like i equals 1 to 3, 
of i squared minus 1, the way this would work, we start with uh, 1. We plug this in here. That's going to be 1 minus 1. So it would be like 1 squared minus 1. And then plus, right, we always add. That's a 1 right there. 1 squared minus 1 plus. Then the index goes to 2. So we plug a 2 in here, 2 squared minus 1. So you go plus 2 squared minus 1, and then plus, because it's always plus. We plug a 3 in there, and then we're done. It goes from 1 to 3, and it stops at 3. So you plug a 3 in there, get 3 squared minus 1. So that would be 1 minus 1 plus 4 minus 1 plus 9 minus 1, and you could add it up. So basically, I just wanted to review, but that is in Appendix E in the book. So if you're a little rusty with summation notation, it's in Appendix E. We don't really have to be, uh, you know, we're not going to use it too much. Just we're, we're going to use it right here. Just make sure that we understand what this means. But you'll see it a little bit more in Calc 2. So right here we could rewrite the above because isn't this really saying sum of this, so starting at 1, so you get f of x sub 1 times delta x plus, then this goes to 2, f of x sub 2 delta x plus, and it goes to 3, and you go all the way to n. So that is really, that is exactly what we did above. This is the right endpoints. Right, that's the, the area using right endpoints, and this is using left endpoints. And you can see when you use left end points, all you do is you're going to start at f of x. And I plug a 1 in there, you get x of 0, right? So we're going to start at 0. And when we plug an n in here, at the end, our last one will be n minus 1. So we don't use the right end point in that last rectangle. We're going to use the left end point. And then this, again, is just using any points. So... These three things right here are just the previous three things written in more compact form.